Every town has a dark side. Today, we head to State College in Pennsylvania, where we learn about the 19-year-old cold case of Cindy Song's Halloween disappearance. Will it be trick or treat? It's the most popular question in thousands of children's minds come Halloween season. But in the minds of State College, Pennsylvania police, and the family and friends of Korean girl, Hyun Jong Song. The question, what happened to Cindy Song, has been eluding them since Halloween of 2001. Cindy was then the 21-year-old Korean girl, a junior co-ed at Pennsylvania State University. And for almost two decades, the answer to the question of what happened to her has always been she vanished. As years pass and memories fade, the details of her vanishing on October 31st, 2001 have become muddled. It drew national attention at the time, but ultimately faded into another cold case. Thus, the Cindy Song disappearance remains one of the most notorious in all of central Pennsylvania. Hi, this is Andrew Fitzgerald, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Everytown. Our podcast this week highlights the heart-trending fate of Cindy Song, who left South Korea and ventured to the United States of America, the melting pot, to earn a good education and secure herself a better future. But all her dreams vanished into thin air one Halloween night when she herself disappeared without a trace. Where did she go? Where could she be? The answers, regrettably, are still unknown. In Seoul, South Korea, where Cindy was born on February 25th, 1980, she spent much of her childhood and teenage years there and was known by her native name, Hyung Jong Song. At a young age, she had displayed having an open mind and a value for independence, which made her dream of getting a better education. Specifically, a Western education that was offered 6,780 miles across the globe in Pennsylvania. Thus, in 1995, the 15-year-old Korean teenage girl decided to move to Springfield, Virginia, where her aunt and uncle lived. She became more known by her American name, Cindy Song, under her relative's care in Springfield. Cindy was able to complete her high school education. She excelled not only academically with consistently good grades, but she also flexed her athletic prowess in playing tennis and running track. The multi-talented girl also discovered a passion for the arts. Writing in her blog, about her love of art, film, music, photography, and dancing. It was no wonder then that when Cindy had an opportunity to enter the prestigious Pennsylvania State University, she took up integrative arts for her major. It's a multidisciplinary student design program combining science, engineering, business, and communication with the arts, which would eventually culminate in a Bachelor of Arts degree upon graduation. Cindy's college major required self-discipline and focus as she was essentially crafting her own academic curriculum. Undoubtedly, she maintained being studious, hardworking, and responsible as an international student who was thriving in all aspects of university life. She was preoccupied juggling her classes and two part-time jobs, one of which was at the Seoul Korean Garden restaurant. Cindy was enjoying every minute of her newfound freedom in America, and despite being steadfastly aware that her focus should be on her studies, 
She didn't deny herself of the thrills, joys, and pleasures of being a young adult in the land of the free. The friends of Cindy's song described her as outgoing, attractive, good-natured, and optimistic. A winning combination of the kind of personality that mixes well with all kinds of people. She was a beautiful young girl who stood five feet one inches tall with long silky black hair. Overcoming cultural barriers, she effortlessly belonged to a tight-knit circle of friends and attracted admirers too. She met and became close friends with Richard Che. They eventually fell in love and moved their romance up a notch by living together at the State College Park apartment in the 300 block of West Clinton Avenue outside of the university campus. It seemed like the stars and the galaxy aligned as all aspects in her life were going well. But as the song goes, some good things never last, and Cindy's love life was the one badly hit by a comet. Her friend said it was Richard who abruptly ended his relationship with Cindy and packed his bags out of their shared apartment in September of 2001. At 21 years old at the time, She still had something great going for her as she was expected to graduate college in April of 2002. But her breakup with Richard left her heart in bad shape. Her resilience, though, enabled her to move on with determination. Thankfully, Cindy soon found a new roommate in Yoon Jun, or Catherine, with whom she formed a friendship. Vowing to metamorphose into a better version of herself. Cindy started going to therapy, taking medication, and writing about her struggles with relationships, self love, and mental health. The process proved to be cathartic, and things were looking optimistic once again for Cindy, a month after experiencing the major heartbreak. She was back on track and had a lot to look forward to. She bought a new computer, turned in an application for a spring graphic design internship, scored tickets to a Britney Spears concert in the last week of October, and prepared to have fun on Halloween night of 2001. Despite October 31st falling on a Wednesday with classes the following day, Cindy didn't want to deprive herself of a breather in between her studies and jobs. Halloween only happens but once a year, and a hardworking young woman enjoying the independence of college life can't pass that up. And so Cindy and her two gal pals, Stacy Paik and Lisa Kim, decided to join a Halloween costume party at Players Nightclub a nearby spot popular with the university crowd on West College Avenue. Her roommate, Catherine, couldn't join them as she visited her family in Philadelphia. In the spirit of fun on the spooky October night, Cindy had created a Halloween costume for her night out. Her friend said that she liked to look cute rather than sexy or sultry like a vixen, so she came up with a bunny rabbit outfit which she fashioned out of a fitted t-shirt with a little rabbit on it. She paired it with a white tennis skirt attached with a fluffy cotton tail, sheer stockings, and brown suede knee-high boots. She topped off her costume with bunny ears, some luxurious fake eyelashes, and her big, infectious smile. The three friends sure had a blast that Halloween night, drinking and dancing until the early hours of November 1st. After the club closed at 2 a.m., Cindy, Stacy, and Lisa drove through downtown and stopped at a friend's unit, 
at the Park Hills apartment complex. Slightly tipsy, they hung out there and played video games for a couple hours. At 4 a.m., Cindy was dropped off at her apartment by Stacy, grabbing some food at a Unimart along the way. Stacy watched Cindy walk towards her apartment, but didn't stay long enough to make sure that she made it in safely. Cindy was last seen walking up a staircase toward her apartment, and her trail ended at the front door, and it started the saga of her mind-boggling disappearance. On the afternoon of November 1, 2001, Cindy's roommate, Catherine, returned to their home after her extended trip. She was expecting to see Cindy in their apartment as they planned to catch up before going out with friends the following night. But Catherine came home to an empty unit with the door locked from the outside. She figured Cindy went out for a bit and would probably be back soon. But two days had passed and Cindy still hadn't returned and her friends didn't even realize it since they were also busy with studies and work. Cindy also lived off campus, so it was quite common that they wouldn't see her most of the time. But when she didn't show up at school or her Saturday shift at a Korean restaurant, it sent an alarming signal to her friends who then notified the police. Hello? But... Since it was a weekend, it took two more days for the report to reach Ferguson Township Police Department lead detective Brian Sprinkle. In the morning of Monday, November 5th, detectives conducted a preliminary investigation of Cindy's apartment. Nothing looked out of place, but she was just gone, Detective Sprinkle said. Nothing utterly suspicious was found inside that would be considered as a sign of a struggle, forced entry, or assault. In fact, the scenario in Cindy's apartment proved that she had entered the house and did some activities in her bedroom after her friend Stacy dropped her home. Her backpack was sitting on the bed with her cell phone tucked into one of its pockets. The fake eyelashes she wore were left in the bathroom sink. Cindy's personal items were present and accounted for. Police also took notice of two Britney Spears concert tickets and a receipt for a computer, which was to be delivered on November 6th. The only things missing were her purse, keys, driver's license, and credit card, and of course, Cindy herself, along with her bunny costume. Her phone record showed neither incoming or outgoing calls were made after she was dropped off at her house. None of her emails seemed alarming either. There was also no activity on any of her credit cards. Detective Sprinkle further stated after the initial investigation, We have no body, we have no crime scene, and we have no actual crime. So it's been very frustrating without any of those pieces of the puzzle. And because of that, It seems like she just vanished into thin air. So with very little to start with at the time, Detective Sprinkle started investigating the inner circle of Cindy's family and worked his way out. He called up the Song family in South Korea, interviewed all her friends, co-workers, and her ex-boyfriend Richard, who left Cindy devastated a couple of months prior. But nothing indicated that anyone close to her was involved in her disappearance. Police then started to lean towards darker possibilities. Perhaps Cindy was in the wrong place at the wrong time, or perhaps she fell prey to a stalker. Sprinkle presented an assumption. We thought maybe, with it being that the giant grocery store was across the street from her apartment complex, and it was open 24 hours that maybe there was something she needed that she had to run over there to get. 
And since Cindy knew it wouldn't take long, she didn't take off her bunny costume or bring her cell phone. Her friend said that it wasn't unusual for her to go to the giant store at unusual hours, but there was no footage of her there and no purchases had been made on any credit cards. The investigators also theorized that drugs might have been a factor after reading entries in Cindy's diary about experimentations with ecstasy and weed. However, her friend stressed these were just regular college experiences, and investigators tended to agree. The investigation then naturally shifted to Cindy's mental state at the time after she suffered through a severe breakup a month before her disappearance. Her family speculated that she may have taken her own life or simply ran off due to this, but Cindy's friends again refuted it. They knew she had started therapy and was taking anti-anxiety medication. Moreover, they knew Cindy wasn't the type of person to simply leave without letting anyone know. She was also said to have been in high spirits on Halloween night, and the fact that Cindy had purchased a new computer and wanted to watch a concert disproved any idea that she ran away. Detective Sprinkle tended to agree. He said, We knew that she was planning ahead. She was looking ahead at different events, so for her to just disappear like that would be unusual. The theory is that yes, she was abducted and then killed. So the question is, does this chilling theory hold any water? A few days later, an interesting lead soon presented itself. A female witness claimed seeing a woman who matched Cindy Song's appearance in a Chinatown district in Philadelphia, some 300 miles away from Penn State University. The Cindy lookalike was allegedly crying and yelling for help as a man attempted to force her into a vehicle. When the witness attempted to intervene, she was chased off by the man who told her to get lost. The woman gave the man's description to a sketch artist and a composite was released. She described him as an Asian male with olive to light brown complexion and medium length hair. However, many inconsistencies in the woman's story led police to stop pursuing the tip. This was yet another dead end. Police kept getting leads all over the place, one of which stated that Cindy was sitting in the audience of The Price is Right. It was unreliable, too. Foul play had been considered by the police from the get-go, so a grim search for Cindy's body started within days after she was reported missing. They started around the apartment complex, including the dumpsters, then searched the dog parks, the woods surrounding the State College Park apartment, and Penn State University with the assistance of volunteer rescue workers. Police helicopters conducted aerial searches. Search and rescue teams explored the North Atherton area. Unfortunately, investigators didn't find Cindy, which agitated and frustrated them. Soon enough, Cindy Song's disappearance gained worldwide attention. Because an international student was involved, the case required involvement of the FBI and the Korean consulate. Inevitably, Cindy's mother, Ban Soon, and brother, Ki Hoon, flew to Pennsylvania to help in the search. A grieving Mrs. Ban Soon said, I wake up every day thinking, hoping that it's not real. They were allowed access to Cindy's apartment, and much to the police's chagrin, they cleaned it up, possibly destroying evidence within the process. Then, despite the search efforts of the local authorities, Cindy's mom soon quickly found fault within the investigation. The Song family felt the police were focusing too much on due process 
and too little on finding Cindy. So they hired New York-based attorney Jin Han to represent their concerns. They also won the support of Penn State University students and various community groups, which resulted in the formation of an action group called the Coalition for the Search for Cindy Song. One student member said, If Cindy is going to be found, we need to create a buzz around here because someone could know some information about what happened to her. This place should be covered top to bottom with Cindy's face. On January 31st, 2002, the coalition held a press conference wherein they slammed the Ferguson Township Police Department for racial bias and negligence for not doing enough to solve Cindy's case. In response, lead detective Sprinkle took it as a consequence of cultural differences, notwithstanding that Cindy's family was upset and frustrated. They didn't understand how things worked here in the U.S. Missing persons cases aren't crimes, so without a crime, you can't get search warrants. You can't get court orders. The bottom line is we've done everything in our power that we could in this case, he explained. But the Song family wasn't convinced. Cindy's mother even took a petition to the governor's office in Harrisburg with 15,000 signatures demanding state police take over the investigation full-time. The Ferguson Township Police Department soon cut off all communication with the family out of frustration, and this left Cindy Song's case of unexplained disappearance at a standstill. It's been said that desperate times call for desperate measures. And before Cindy's case made her loved ones go berserk further, an unconventional help into the investigation was considered. The Penn State Paranormal Research Society requested that Carla Barron, a nationally recognized psychic profiler, come in to aid police in August of 2002. Carla came to the college to work on the case and she described what she believed happened to Cindy. She said, When this first came up, I'd seen three to four men that were with Cindy, so I knew that she was abducted and I knew it was sexual in nature. And I'm just seeing her being loaded into this vehicle. Then I see it wasn't very long before she had crossed over. Carla gave more insights to the police, but... They didn't translate into credible leads. Thus, Cindy's case remained in limbo and seemingly hopeless. That is, until a year later, when a convicted man came forward, ready to spill the beans about Cindy's tragedy. One man's misfortune became a ray of hope for a Korean girl a year and a half after she went missing in November of 2001. A career criminal named Paul Weekly was convicted of burglary in Lazarne County, Pennsylvania in June of 2003. In order to reduce his charges, Paul agreed to give police information about Cindy Song's disappearance and what an explosive story he told. It involved serial killer Hugo Selensky and a man named Michael Krakowski who was a pharmacist convicted of several felonies for running an illegal drug ring. According to Paul, the two men had mistaken the bunny costume Cindy as a prostitute at the time she vanished. They picked her up from the college and took her to Hugo's home in Hunlock Creek. That's where they imprisoned Cindy in a vault, assaulted her numerous times over the course of a few days, and left her to die. Paul further revealed that Hugo also killed Michael and his girlfriend, Tammy Fassett, for a seemingly flimsy reason. Michael wanted Cindy's bunny ears as a souvenir, and it enraged Hugo. 
13 more people had been killed by Hugo, according to Paul, who led investigators to Hugo's property where five dead bodies were unearthed in the backyard. Proving that Paul's story was true, two of the bodies belonged to Michael and Tammy, while two others were those of drug dealers Frank James and I.D. Kyler, and the fifth one was never identified. Paul later revised his story, saying that $60,000 worth of drug money was the reason Hugo killed Michael and Tammy. Regardless of the reason, though, it was a lead for police, so they continued digging and found seven more bodies. But it was a big disappointment for the investigators because Cindy wasn't one of the remains. Perhaps Hugo might have moved onto his property a few months after Cindy went missing. Investigators were never able to connect him to her disappearance, but he has not been ruled out as a suspect. And since his cohort, Michael, is dead, they were never able to confirm Paul's story. Then investigators found many online articles about Cindy's case downloaded in Paul's computer. This led the police to speculate Paul used false details about Cindy's murder in exchange for a reduced sentence. Police also considered Paul as Cindy's abductor and killer, who just took the opportunity to use Hugo as a scapegoat. But without evidence, Paul wasn't connected in killing Cindy. And nevertheless, both Hugo and Paul served life sentences for separate crimes. So, once again, Cindy Song's case has now been ditched into the cold, leaving those who tried to resolve it with sadness and remorse. Detective Brian Sprinkle said, It's Ferguson Township. We really don't have cases that get that big. So it was difficult and it was personal because it was my case and I wanted to find her. Obviously, anything I could do to give the family closure meant a lot to me. In the meantime, Cindy's loved ones have to contend with the sad and bad memory that each Halloween brings until they receive not a trick, but a real treat and possibly finding out the truth once and for all. So that's it for this week's episode of Every Town. Tune in next week for another episode filled with scary, strange, and mysterious stories. And who knows, maybe your town's gonna be next.